coming today. Welcome to the Hot Topics Lecture Series. I see some veterans who are already di have dove dived into their lunch, which is encouraged. Um, and uh, for those of you who uh, haven't been here before and are looking for CLE credit, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, but mostly I want to turn to, actually, let me get my notes. Oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know Carrie well, who is who's a, a longtime friend of the law school and a former LLM student. But we're, we're pleased to welcome Carrie Scufari today. She's currently um, in a job at the uh, New York Department of State Division of Consumer Protection, but has exciting news is uh, moving shortly to um, be uh, in the Office of General Counsel with the FDA. Correct. Is that correct? Yep. Starting soon. So that's exciting. Um, <laughs> yes, congratulations. Thank you. Carrie is, uh, she teaches in our online program. Um, she's clerked in the New York State Appellate Division. Um, she has her JD from Maryland, but she uh, recovered from that and got her LLM in Food and Ag Law right here at Vermont Law School. And she'll be talking about FDA and risk-based enforcement. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you, David. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to David and to Courtney and to Bill also and Jennifer for helping make sure all the technology pieces are up and running. Uh, and I just want to thank Vermont Law for the invitation to come back. It's always wonderful to return to campus, and I'm really grateful to be here and have this time to spend with all of you. And before I get started, I also I need to do those typical disclaimers when you're working for the government that everything I'm about to say are my own opinions. They are not the views of the Department of State Division of Consumer Protection. They're also not the views of FDA. So these are my own opinions here today. And the title of my talk is FDA and Risk-Based Enforcement for Homeopathic Products, Compromised Consumer Protection, or Stepped Up Scrutiny. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this particular topic today is, as David mentioned, I teach in Vermont's online learning program. And I teach in the federal regulation of food law and policy. And often as part of that course, I will give my students updates, FDA in the news, bits and FDA is often in the news and there has been a lot of headlines in recent years regarding these homeopathic products and problems that are arising in the marketplace with these items. And my students started asking, you know, well, are these drugs? Are they a food? Are they dietary supplements? What are these things? Uh, and what exactly is regulated by the FDA? Uh, and then the, the question that I always love getting the most because it really demonstrates critical thinking skills, well, is this method of regulation working or can we do it better? And so the substance of my talk today and the article that I'm also writing arose out of my efforts to better answer those questions. So by the end of my talk today, I'm hoping that you'll take away three items. Uh, one, being able to define what homeopathic products are and recognizing them in the grocery store. And also learning how to read those labels because it's a little bit different than other over-the-counter OTC drugs that you might encounter. Second, I hope you'll be able to understand how FDA has regulated these products in the past. And then lastly, I'm hoping that you'll understand the new draft guidance that FDA recently released in December proposing a new regulatory scheme and how that might change the landscape going forward. So that's the goal for today. First, we're going to orient ourselves in the context of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This is a very rough uh, outline, thumbnail sketch. It's a very long, complicated statute. So I'm not going to go into all of the nuances and intricacies today because we only have an hour. Uh, but I'm going to sketch for you the basic lay of the land. And then I'm going to make my argument that homeopathic products under FDA's new proposed guidance, uh, that this is a step in the right direction, that this will lead to better consumer protection, better products on the marketplace, and it's a, it's a good forward step uh, towards better consumer regulation. And then I'm happy to entertain your questions and, and thoughts on these issues. So to get started, like I said, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is a huge statute. FDA regulates over a quarter of the U.S. economy with the various products. The main categories, as you can see on there, are food, dietary supplements, 
drugs, which includes both prescription drugs and over-the-counter drugs, as well as medical devices and biologics. I did not include on here cosmetics, uh, just because of time constraints, or tobacco, uh, but those are also products that are regulated, as well as all veterinary drugs, too. But we're going to uh, speak strictly about humans today. So in terms of how each of these areas is defined by FDA, a food is defined as any article used for food or drink. It seems relatively straightforward. It also includes chewing gum, and it includes any component part of articles used for food or drink. So any food additives, and also anything in the food packaging that migrates into the food. So any of your disposable containers, your plastic bags of lettuce in the grocery store, if anything migrates into the food, then that is also considered a food subject to FDA's regulation. Dietary supplements are also regulated as foods under the Act, but they're a little bit different in terms of they're meant to supplement the diet, and they consist of vitamins, amino acids, minerals, uh, but they cannot be represented as a conventional food item, and they cannot be the sole item of a meal or a diet. Again, it's, they're intended to supplement. So that's how you distinguish between a food and a dietary supplement. Medical devices are similar to drugs in terms of their use. So they're used to either diagnose, treat, cure, mitigate, or prevent disease but not through a chemical reaction. They are implants or mechanical devices that are used either outside of or inside the body. And there's three classifications for medical devices. And the regulatory oversight corresponding to each increases with the class number. So a class one item would be the toothbrush that hopefully everybody used this morning. Not a high risk product, not a lot of level of oversight, but it is regulated by the FDA. A class three product would be a pacemaker, much more regulatory oversight associated with that product. And then biologics are also items that are intended to cure, treat, prevent, or mitigate disease. But unlike drugs that are chemically synthesized, biologics are derived from living microorganisms or human or animal cells. So there is a heightened level of oversight involved with those are more volatile substances, the molecules are a bit larger. So just from a scientific, biological perspective, they're a little bit trickier to regulate. And then finally, we have drugs. And I save these for last because homeopathic products are actually regulated as a drug within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And just as drugs can be prescription or over-the-counter, homeopathic products can also be over-the-counter or prescription drugs as well. And drugs are, as I said, chemically synthesized, intended to treat, prevent, cure, mitigate symptoms of disease. And you can see the actual full definition uh, that's right there. They can also be intended to affect the structure or function of the body. So if you think of prescription medications that you would take to lower cholesterol, uh, to reduce high blood pressure. Those would be drugs that fall within that letter C category there, intending to affect the structure or function of the body. Uh, any drug ingredient or any drug monograph, which is like a, a recipe for over-the-counter drugs, has to be included within the official United States pharmacopoeia or the homeopathic pharmacopoeia, as well as the national formulary. These are regulated uh, items that are officially recognized in these compendiums. So what is not a drug? Uh, it's interesting with the, with the food as medicine movement that we're starting to see. So a food or a dietary supplement cannot be a drug merely because the label says it is. It really depends on the components of the product and what its primary purpose is in the body and how it's intended for use by humans. So even if the labels are truthful and not misleading, you don't get to regulate it as a drug sim or market it as a drug simply because you call it one. Um, so to highlight where it gets a little bit tricky and I, I think interesting, 
I have a picture of German chamomile up there, and I think this is illustrative of the complexities within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act because this plant can be regulated as an herb, as a dietary supplement. Uh, it can also be regulated as a food. Uh, if you've ever had chamomile tea, remember that definition of a food, any article used for food or drink, that would be regulated as a food. Uh, it's also a primary ingredient in homeopathic medicine as well, and it's been used to treat anything from frayed nerves, upset stomach, uh, skin irritations, and even minor infections dealing with chest colds or headaches. But interestingly enough, German chamomile is not recognized uh, as a drug on FDA's online database on their website. So I can understand when my students come to me and say, well, I, I don't understand, like, where does this fall and how does FDA regulate this? Because it's not really as clear cut as you might imagine. So now that we've oriented ourselves within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit more about what exactly homeopathic products are. And the genesis of the name homeo means similar in Greek, pathos is for suffering or disease. And Samuel Hahnemann is recognized as the father of homeopathy. Uh, he started developing this theory in the late 1700s. And it's important to sort of place yourself in history and understand what the lay of the land was medically speaking at this time. Medicine was very uh, rough going. Uh, there was bloodletting, purging, blistering. These were all common treatments of the time. And uh, the treatment was often worse than the disease. <laughs> and so what Hahnemann was trying to do is come up with a more natural, safer, kinder, gentler way to some of these uh, really brutal practices of the time. And so the theory that he developed was he could treat disease by administering certain substances that would cause the symptoms of that disease in a healthy person, but only a little bit so that the body could suffer from a, a, a triggered healing reaction and then the immune system would be better able to overcome that disease or those symptoms. That's the theory. Uh, I hesitate to use this as an analogy because the science is not the same, but if you think about the idea behind vaccines where you're administering a little bit of the product, uh, it's like that, but there's actually scientific studies supporting vaccine use, as I'll talk about. The scientific studies for homeopathy, they just haven't borne out in terms of those random double-blind uh, trials that drugs and OTC drugs have to go through. Um, so that's the idea. There's two basic tenets to homeopathy. The first is like cures like, or the law of similars, and that's what I was just discussing. If you have, if you're feeling nauseous, you would take a substance uh, that is intended to induce vomiting or nausea. I, I don't really understand that. <laughs> just from, like just trying to wrap my head around that, but that was that was the idea. Like cures like, law of similars. And then the second main tenet of homeopathy is the law of minimum dose or the law of infinitesimal doses. And so obviously if you're suffering from nausea and you take a natural substance that is designed to induce nausea or vomiting, you need to take it at a diluted level so that you don't make yourself sicker than you already are. And so this is the idea with the law of minimum dose. You would dilute the substance and then dilute it again to the point where it would be rendered at a safe level. Um, interestingly enough, and I can't wrap my head around this either, even after reviewing all the scientific literature, in homeopathy, the more diluted the substance is, the more potent it is believed to be. And we'll talk about why that's a bit problematic in a moment. So again, this is the homeopathic pharmacopoeia. Uh, it's a compilation of all the standards for what is allowed to be put into homeopathic products. If an ingredient does not, it does not appear in this pharmacopoeia, then it's not considered a homeopathic ingredient. And there are items in the grocery store that are labeled homeopathic, but they have homeopathic ingredients mixed in with other OTC ingredients. And FDA says, nope, that's no good. If 
you can only have strictly homeopathic. You can't be mixing different products. But this happens in the marketplace all the time. It's problematic because those products have never been studied to ensure that they're safe, that there's not drug interactions happening that nobody intended, or that they're effective. Uh, and most consumers don't know that when they're going into the drugstore to purchase these products. As I said before, it contains monographs or recipes for different drug ingredients and what is permitted to be used in homeopathic treatment. And you can see the section where this is officially recognized in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So what was the prior method of enforcement? How has FDA regulated these products in the past? Well, the guidance comes from 1988, and until December of 2017, hadn't been updated since that time. And the guidance basically said that homeopathic products are drugs, but FDA wasn't really going to regulate them the same way as drugs. And this is a policy known as enforcement discretion. So FDA had the ability to regulate these products as drugs, subject to all of that pre-market regulatory approval, to ensure that the products are both safe and effective, but FDA chose not to. And it's important to understand why and what was happening at the time. So during this time, there was a review happening of all of the food additive ingredients. There was a review happening of all of the over-the-counter ingredients. There was a review happening of all the prescription drugs, tens of thousands of prescription drugs. So the agency was just incredibly overburdened with all of these products. And when it came to homeopathic products, if you remember back to those two central tenets of homeopathy, these were products that were so incredibly diluted. They were composed mainly of natural substances like that German chamomile. They just were not thought to pose a public health threat in the same way that some of these other drugs in the marketplace pose. And so FDA almost had to put them on the back shelf at the time, given all of the other competing concerns that the agency had. But at the same time, there were a list of guidance um, statements about how they are supposed to be labeled, what ingredients can you use. Uh, and FDA always had the power to subject any of these products to an enforcement action or to seize any of these products if they were mislabeled or adulterated. It just ultimately elected not to for most of the regulatory history. The problem with this is that back in 1988, seemed like a good idea. Homeopathy was almost a, a dying industry at that point in time. Science, had again, had not borne out that these products were effective for any of their uses. And so it was really starting to fall away. Uh, and then all of a sudden it sort of experienced a revival and today you have homeopathy that's it's a three billion dollar industry and there's many more products in the marketplace than there ever were in 1988 and so this policy of enforcement discretion ultimately led to the proliferation of a vast number of products on the shelves that have not been approved by the FDA and when I tell my, I, I was shocked when I learned this, and, and my students were all shocked uh, when we discussed this. There is not a single homeopathic product marketed in the US that FDA has approved. And when I say that, I mean FDA has not tested the product prior to it being marketed for either safety or efficacy. And there's no homeopathic product that has subsequently been evaluated post market for safety, efficacy, or quality. Now again, if you're thinking these are substances that are natural, they've been heavily diluted, what's the worst that could happen? Maybe people just think that there's a placebo effect happening, and what's so wrong with that? Well, the, the problem is that uh, people were becoming sick and dying from taking some of these products. So things were not being manufactured or used as intended, and FDA eventually had to reconcile that this prior policy of enforcement discretion was just really no longer working in today's marketplace. And so I have an example up here that I, I always, I, this is one of my favorite ones. If you, if you have poison ivy or po poison oak, which is, you know, you're bound to come across this at some point if you're doing any kind of hiking in Vermont, 
Uh, if you wanted to take a natural substance to alleviate the symptoms of your condition, this is a very common item that you could get in just about any drugstore food co-op. And I apologize for the small type on the drug facts panel. I was trying to blow it up large enough. Um, but if you actually look at the ingredients, uh, it makes me really reticent to purchase this product or use it on my skin. So think back to like cures like. If you have poison ivy or poison oak, you've got itching, blistering, burning skin. Not fun. Uh, but what homeopathic remedy do you use? You have something that includes poison ivy. And you're going to put that on your skin. That's the very first item that's up there, the Ruth Toxicodendron. Uh, then, and I'm going to actually skip to the next slide so that you can see these a little bit um, more. So that's the first item. It, it actually is the plant, poison ivy. The second item is croton piglium. Uh, its common name is purging cotton. Uh, if you eat this, it's going to make you vomit. Uh, if you put it on your skin, it's, it's going to cause blisters. Uh, highly poisonous. Those are the top two ingredients. And then the third ingredient is xerophyllum, and this is really interesting. The common name is bear grass. The reason that this became a homeopathic product to use for poison ivy or poison oak is because it survives fires and re-sprouts easily and actually does well under periodic burning conditions. So it's great for forest ecology. That's wonderful. But I don't want to put it on my skin just because it survives burning fire. I don't think it's going to help me on my skin. But again, just my personal opinion. But these are your three ingredients that you're using. Uh, so I'm going to go back, actually, so you can see the drug panel. So those are the three ingredients uh, listed on there. But then if you actually look to the right of the Latin names, you'll see 6XHPUS. So it's important to not only read what the active ingredients are, which I think we can agree are scary. Uh, the other important part of reading these labels is the dilution factor. And so how a dilution works uh, refers to the method of sequential dilution that was used in producing the product. So X refers to the ingredient, whether it's that poison ivy, the Persian cotton, or the bear grass. And the initial dilution, when you see an X, is it's diluted to one part in 10. The number that appears afterwards is the number of continual successive dilutions that occurred. So here, 6X, that one part in 10 was repeated six times. So then you eventually end up with one part in a million. So maybe that doesn't sound as scary if it's been diluted to that degree. Uh, still concerning. And my mind. Um, so again, what necessitated some of the changes in the marketplace? As I said, the $3 billion industry. Uh, there were concerns that the scientific literature was just not supporting the use of homeopathic products. Uh, and, the, and the studies that seemed to support it, uh, there were huge flaws in the methodology that those studies were, that the studies had used. And those results couldn't be repeated in successive studies. So people started questioning the science. And then Scott Gottlieb, the commissioner of FDA, he expressed many concerns with the proliferation of these products in the marketplace. And the first is that people were using items that hadn't been proven effective. People had serious ailments or conditions. They were foregoing traditional medical treatment that had been proven safe and effective. And they were using these products uh, that weren't safe or effective. But the bigger concern was that these were worse than placebos. They were, there were actually instances of harm occurring in the marketplace where people, not only were they, was it not just a placebo, but it was actually causing illness or death in people. And the reason that this was happening was because some of these products were either poorly manufactured, they were mislabeled in terms of the dilution, or the dilution was not consistent across products. So again, if you think back to that poison ivy, if you mess up your dilution somewhere along the line, that could have real harm uh, that people could suffer. And the big concern is that a lot of these products are marketed for use in children. And so as a healthy adult, maybe our immune systems can handle something that's not diluted properly or that's mislabeled. But if you take that product and you give it to an infant or you give it to a mother who's trying to 
battle the effects of nausea in her first trimester and you haven't conducted any safety or efficacy testing to know how that product will impact the fetus, then you start developing a lot of public health concerns and what's going on in the market. I love this comic strip. Um, it demonstrates why placebos maybe are not harmless. And it's, um, this is under the best case scenario, like I said. This is not an instance where there's actually been real harm that has occurred. So what are some of the other concerns? I actually have some props that I'm going to pass around. Um, is Janet Milne here? I love taking her land use class when I was an LLM student. And she, uh, when we talked about uh, a Frito-Lay manufacturing plant, she actually brought in corn chips for everybody, which was wonderful. Um, I'm not that great. So don't eat these. these. Well, eat at your own risk if you want, but thanks. You want to pass those around. Um, I don't recommend it. Again, just my opinion. So these are some commonly uh, used products. You can take a look there to see what the label is, what the ingredients are, what the dilution factor is. Um, and these are right here in our own co-op. Um, but you can get them at any CVS or Rite Aid drugstore, any place really. So FDA first started looking at how it was regulating these products with Highland's teething tablets. And there actually is a Highland product that I purchased and I'm passing around. Thankfully, the Highland teething tablets are no longer on the market. Uh, the reason that these teething tablets were so concerning is that one of the natural ingredients in there is a plant called belladonna. Uh, very toxic, I'm <laughs> hearing some, yeah, yeah, this is bad stuff. Um, and actually one of the products, I think it's the cold remedy product, has belladonna in it. So it's not marketed to children anymore, but I still don't recommend adults taking it. And the problem with belladonna is that it contains strychnine, which is a highly toxic substance. It's often used as a pesticide. It's a very common rodenticide. If you're eating organic and you're trying to have natural medication, it's really not an ingredient that you want to be putting in your body, um, let alone giving to your small children. And what was happening was it was causing seizures uh, and, and death in, in several reported instances of children. And so uh, unfortunately, that is that what really alerts FDA to sort of start changing some of its practices is when you have these awful serious effects happening or instances resulting in death. So all of Highland's teething tablets that had belladonna in them, they've, the company, after much pushing from FDA, voluntarily recalled these products. You should not be able to find them on the shelves anymore. But like I said, there still are ingredient, there still are other products that have belladonna in them. Uh, the zinc intranasal products, these were marketed to both children and adults as a cold remedy. Uh, the problem with these is that hundreds and hundreds of people either temporarily or permanently lost their sense of smell after taking these products. And the company had received reports of this and had not shared that with the FDA, um, even though it was obligated to disclose that. And so that, that's a huge problem. Uh, another, another issue is over-the-counter homeopathic asthma products. Asthma is a life-threatening condition. And remember that these products have not been te tested for safety or efficacy. And this product is in shelves, on shelves right next to OTC asthma medications. So if you don't know any better, you could be taking something that hasn't been proven safe or effective and you don't know until you're in the middle of that asthma attack and you can't breathe. Um, again, very dangerous situation. And then there's just a whole bunch of other homeopathic products that contain potentially toxic ingredients. And people think homeopathy, it's more natural. Well, hemlock's natural, arsenic's natural. Um, it doesn't mean that it's good for you. And this is one of my favorite ones right here, this uh, Nux Vomica. In fact, when I was purchasing this, um, a woman came up to me in the co-op and she was like, oh yeah, I took that for my four pregnancies. I was sick as a dog. I think it just made it worse. Like, yeah, it probably wasn't diluted properly. Because <laughs> um, the, the problem with this um, either hangover relief medication, uh, if you have a hangover, so take something that's going to make you vomit, 
Uh, or if you have motion sickness or morning sickness, take something that will make you vomit. That's what Nux Vomica does. And so this 30 cc, um, C here is another common method of dilution. So if you see an X, that product has been diluted to one part in 10. If you see that letter C, that's diluted to one part in 100. And then that is repeated 30 times. So this hangover relief item that you have here, that's been diluted to one part in one, followed by 60 zeros. Uh, the problem with that is, okay, maybe it's not gonna make you vomit, but scientists also can't find any of the original substance remaining when something's been diluted to that extent. So if you're taking, I mean, the, the other common ingredient there is lactose. You're essentially taking sugar. Um, not very helpful. So FDA started having all of these different experiences with these products. Uh, either they just, they weren't working uh, or they were actually harming people. And so it started reevaluating. At the 25 year mark, it started reevaluating the, its prior guidance. And so in March of 2015, FDA announced that it was going to reconsider how it had been regulating these products in light of the growth of industry, the passage of more than two decades of the issuance of the 19 ID, 1988 guidance, uh, and the, the concerns that were happening in the marketplace. In April of 2015, FDA held a public hearing to obtain information and comments from stakeholders regarding homeopathic products and the agency's regulatory framework. It received over 9,000 different comments. And the comments were really interesting. There's different classes of people who were commenting on these products. And there were people who were concerned uh, that these products would be regulated out of existence and that you, these products would no longer be available for people. Um, and that was primarily proponents of the homeo homeopathic industry. This is a concern because a lot of people who purchase these products, they can fall into different camps. One group uh, are, they're the, the whole foods group. You know, they like to buy organic, they like to purchase the natural substances. If they're spending money on products that aren't effective, it's not harming them to the same degree as this other class of people who are low to moderate income folks who don't have access to health care. And if they're spending, again, that $3 billion industry, if they're spending substantial amounts of money on products that aren't safe or effective, and they don't really have that money to be able to spend, that is more concerning. Um, so people falling into those camps were commenting. As you can imagine, the drug industry is commenting. They don't want homeopathic products on the market because they're a competitor. So they were hoping to shut down the marketplace. Um, and then you also actually had some homeopathic manufacturers who were supportive of a revised regulatory scheme because they really believed in the products that they were creating and they thought if there was additional oversight that it would eliminate some of these bad actors from the market and would actually boost their sales. So lots of different interests at play here. In December 2017, after evaluating all of these comments and after reviewing all of the information obtained from the public hearings, FDA issued new guidance eliminating the enforcement discretion old model and shifting to what it calls risk-based enforcement. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, this attracted so much public attention that the 90-day comment period was extended. It just closed last month, but as of earlier this week when I went onto the website, FDA is still accepting submissions. So if you're bothered by what you hear here today, maybe you want to go home and comment um, after the lecture is over. So what is risk-based enforcement? How is this different than the lay of the land that had been happening previously? So. FDA is, it's still, uh, the agency still doesn't have the amount of resources to evaluate every single homeopathic product on the marketplace the same way that it does drugs. It, it just doesn't have the resources to do that. So it went through and it evaluated, okay, what are the homeopathic products most likely to cause the most public harm? And let's concentrate our enforcement efforts in these targeted areas. So how can we work within our resource constraints 
and still achieve the most public good for the greatest number of people. And after approaching the problem from that perspective, FDA came up with these six categories. So the first item is products with repeated safety concerns. These are things that occur on MedWatch, the FDA's online, online reporting system for adverse health events. Uh, these would be things like the loss of smell related to those zinc intranasal products. The second category, products that contain or purport to contain ingredients associated with potentially significant safety concerns. Those would be your belladonna containing teething tablets and gels. Item three, pr products for routes of administration other than uh, ingestion or topical. So these are unapproved injectables, uh, things that you would put into your eye. Um, there are, you know, if, if you put something on your skin, a lot of it's going to get absorbed, but the skin is a, a barrier. And if you're ingesting something, um, there's a certain amount of things the body can do to sort of protect you from what you're consuming. Um, but if you're injecting right into the bloodstream or you're putting things directly into your eyes, there is a heightened sense of concern with those routes of administration. The fourth item, the fourth category, products intended to be used for the prevention or treatment of serious and or life-threatening diseases and conditions. Uh, unfortunately, there are still homeopathic products on the marketplace that are not that different from the snake oil salesmanship that we saw prior to the passing of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in 1938. Uh, there are products that say they will cure cancer, they will cure Parkinson's disease, Crohn's disease, uh, also asthma, uh, that, that is a serious life-threatening condition. So FDA is trying to root out those products for their fraudulent labels or to make sure that there's science that backs up the use of those labels. Item, or category five, products for vulnerable populations. These include infants, like the teething tablets. They would include pregnant women. Uh, or those with autoimmune diseases. And again, the concern here is not only safety, uh, but that people with autoimmune diseases, they might be foregoing actual safe and effective medical treatment and relying on these remedies that are not going to help them in the same way. And then the last category are products that are deemed adulterated under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So these are products that are either mislabeled or the dilution strength is not consistent and they're, they're causing harm or death in populations who are taking these products. So what's the verdict? Uh, is, this, is this a good thing? Do, does this compromise consumer protection? Should the FDA be doing more? Should it be shutting down the homeopathic market? Should it be regulating these products exactly like drugs? Or is this actually a step in the right direction uh, with heightened scrutiny to the riskiest products that are in the marketplace. Uh, there's people who belong to both camps, and you can make an argument for both. I, I think this is a step in the right direction. As I mentioned before, just the resource constraints that the agency faces right now, uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's feasible or realistic to insist that FDA regulate every single homeopathic product the way it regulates drugs. And I, I should say the reason FDA has been able to successfully regulate the drug market, although again that, that can be argued too, is that there are user fees associated with prescription and OTC drugs. So manufacturers actually have to pay FDA a substantial amount of money to review all of the science, all of those double blind trials, and come up with FDA's own independent assessment. Uh, there are no user fees in food, and there are no user fees in dietary supplements, and no user fees with homeopathic medicines. Whether something like that would be recommended in the future remains to be seen, but that's the lay of the land right now. So I think it's positive that FDA is saying, you know, it, it reiterates it has the authority to regulate these products like drugs, and for products that fall into those six categories, it will start regulating them and exercising its enforcement powers. Uh, the new guidance applies to product labeling and marketing as well, so I also think that's positive. Consumers are very susceptible to advertising and what is on the label, so I think that's a good step forward. Um, 
again, it's not practical to require all homeopathic products to undergo FDA approval. So depending on what you think about that, that could be a positive or a negative. Um, this could also be a positive or a negative. Economic adulteration really isn't addressed by any of those six categories where FDA is going to exercise this heightened enforcement. And as I mentioned, if people are spending a lot of money on products that aren't effective, that's concerning when you think about how broken our medical care system already is and how expensive everything already is. This is just another exacerbation of that problem. However, if you're talking about people who are going to be out you know, $11.96 for a product that essentially is milk sugar versus a product that's going to cause death in an infant, maybe it is better that FDA is targeting those more concerning products and maybe we'll get to economic adulteration in the future. And then something else that's a positive or a negative depending on how you look at it. The timeline for this is unknown. Um, this is only a draft policy guidance. So the old guidance is still in effect. Uh, and like I said, the comment period just closed. At this time, FDA is reviewing all of those comments and then we'll, starting to, we'll begin working on final draft guidance. But when and how quickly that gets released is anybody's guess at this point in time. But FDA did say in the draft guidance that essentially all homeopathic manufacturers are on constructive notice now. Uh, FDA doesn't have to give any warning. It can immediately start seizing these products or instituting enforcement actions against them. So I think that's actually a good balance. It's trying to uh, alert manufacturers that, hey, we're watching you, um, even while we're still working on drafting that final guidance. And this little guy is very happy that those Hyven teething tablets are off of the market. Uh, so at this point in time, that concludes my presentation, and I would be thrilled to take your questions and your comments. Thank you. Yeah, I believe we have somebody going along with microphones, so maybe we can go right here. Okay. Um, hi. Thank you so much for that lecture. Um, I. I have two things I wanted to, one was just a comment and one is a question. Um, I wanted to go back to the poison ivy example that you yeah. gave and with the three ingredients um, and how you indicated that they weren't something you would want to put on your body and poison ivy um, as a first ingredient seems counterintuitive. I don't think that it sounds so counterintuitive, and I think that we use that logic a lot in the in the um, medicinal field. So, I mean, when you get a flu vaccine, it's they're, mm -hmm. you, they're injecting you with the flu virus. Right. So it's you know I I don't I don't I think that that makes a lot of sense actually to to have poison ivy be the first active ingredient. It's very similar to what we're doing with when you get a flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just my comment. Question um, is with 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 the voluntary notification system that we have for glass substances in which any producer of food or dietary supplements can legally um, put in pretty much any substance they want and it's voluntary to notify the FDA, I'm just wondering how homeopathic um, products are really any, any different than the food and the dietary substance markets that are pretty much, you know, so under-regulated and we really, there's so much in all of those products that we don't know that the FDA doesn't even know mm -hmm. because producer manufacturers aren't required to disclose that. So it seems a little weird to me to target, you know, homeopathic products um, on their own for mm -hmm. not knowing, or for the FDA not knowing exactly what's in them. Exactly. Thank you. Um, th that's a great question and thank you for your comment too. Um, I do want to respond just to your comment just very briefly first. Um, if people want to use these products, I believe in consumer choice and that they should have the right and whatever makes sense to them. My main concern is that these products be evaluated for safety and efficacy. Um, so if you think about the flu vaccine, that has been proven, proven by the randomized uh, double-blind trials to be safe and effective, whereas these products have not. And consumers don't know that. So consumers are buying these thinking that they've been approved and they haven't been. So as long as there's the regulation in place and the consumer awareness and education, I think those are the, the key pieces that I would like to see in the marketplace. 
And then with respect to your question about the GRAS substances, so GRAS stands for generally recognized as safe, and it's evaluated in terms of food ingredients and food additives. But remember, homeopathic products are drugs. So there's a different regulatory system in place for foods and for drugs. And with the GRAS substances, the whole reason that those additives were kind of carved out and put in that special category was because at the time in 1938 when that category was created, the only sort of GRAS substances that existed were things like sugar, salt, vinegar, things that had been used in the food supply for eons, essentially, without any harm being associated with them. Now, you could argue that today, things like sugar and salt and the quantities in which they're used, that is different. Um, but at the time, they were carved out because they were thought to be safe. And so you could use them in the food. And again, it was to ease the regulatory burden on the agency as it was reviewing all these new food additives. So it's, it's a different scheme that's in place. Although the commissioner has recognized and prior commissioners have recognized that the GRAS scheme is also broken. It's not working anymore precisely because of what you mentioned, this voluntary notification scheme. So food manufacturers no longer, there's no requirement that they alert FDA to the ingredients that they're putting in foods. Um, so it has led some critics to dub the GRAS scheme not generally recognized as safe, but generally recognized as secret. Um, so that, it, that's a huge problem. Um, it most certainly is, and arguably a bigger problem than homeopathics. And which again is though why I think that this risk-based enforcement is a step in the right direction because it tries to balance between products that have proven harmful and dangerous versus agency constraints and these other areas that the agency is responsible for regulating uh, where there's even more concern and arguably more harm. So that's a good, good question, thank you. All right, yes, Pamela. Hi, Karen. Hi. What's the operative difference between economic adulteration and misbranding that is deceptive or false labeling? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So economic adulteration is actually not recognized in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act anywhere, and it's not a cause of action that you can bring under the act or independently on its own. You could under a state consumer protection statute that recognizes it, um, but you can't actually do that within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act itself. Um, but enforcement actions could be brought for misbranding or adulteration. Um, the Government Accountability Office has recognized the issue of economic adulteration and has recommended that FDA recognize it as a problem. FDA hasn't to date yet. Uh, again, probably because of those resource constraints. But misbranding would be uh, something like you were induced to purchase a product that you otherwise wouldn't have because of the way that the label appeared. Mm -hmm. But there's no economic um, damages associated with that. You couldn't get your money back or anything like that. Um, that would have to, if you were interested in that, that would have to come under a state consumer protection. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Because it sets the in economic adulteration, there's intent to deceive, whereas you don't have to show that intent in just misbranding. And yes, and intent can play a role in that as well. And that's probably why it wasn't included in the act, is because proving that level of intent can be so difficult. Yep. Thank you. Um, I think we had somebody. Oh, you already have a microphone. Yes, Great. I do. Um, is there data, good data, on the use of homeopathic products? And if so, is, have you seen an increase of the use of, of homeopathy or the products given the high cost of mm -hmm. healthcare and the sometimes prohibitive cost of pharmaceuticals? Yeah, there, there, was a, there is good data on that. And there was a good study that was done that evaluated across the US over the years the increase in alternative medicine. Um, and then that study further broke out the amount of U.S. consumers by adults and by children, and then by alternative medicine practitioners. So it separated out those who wanted massage or um, acupuncture versus homeopathic medicine. And so that's how we can see that this trend is growing because more consumers are availing themselves of these products. 
But overall, it's between somewhere between 1% and 2% of the entire American population uh, as of 2017. And so to go back to that earlier question about why are homeopathic products being targeted, it's important to recognize that this is a problem. It is a huge growing industry. But it, overall, in terms of everything else the agency is responsible for regulating, it's a very small fraction of, of those products. Thank you. Yes. A proposition and then a, a suggestion. Ho uh, hopefully you will um, uh, react to it uh, within the confines of Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Mm -hmm. The proposition or the provocation is this. Given how drugs are supposed to be regulated for safety and efficacy, mm -hmm. this is faith healing for atheists. There is no scientific basis for any of this stuff except an 18th century ideology that fits in, ironically, with vaccines are scary, I gotta eat organic on some kind of precautionary culinary principle, no scientific support for any of this. It's I almost as you. bad as <laughs> it's almost as bad as chiropractic. But you know, I, I've now I've now managed to offend at least mo uh, the entire room. So 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 now <laughs> let's just keep going. Okay. But so you I have do a significant number of people who agree with you. But it is it's faith healing. It's faith healing for atheists. And basically, anyone who is willing to to um, play with homeopathy needs to ride their children directly to the Department of Health Services and get them vaccinated for everything. All right, so having said that, let me, let me make the suggestion, which is actually legal, and I want to invite your response to this. Mm -hmm. All of this actually goes back, I think, to another 1980s case involving the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and the agency, which is Heckler versus Cheney. And Heckler versus Cheney is a uh, very big icon in administrative law because it talks about committed to agency discretion under the Administrative Procedure Act. And it happened, uh, if you look back at that case, to involve a death penalty challenge to drugs being used in executions because quite obviously they hadn't been tested for the safety and efficacy for the intended use of killing humans. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that we may be, I'm just suggesting, um, working out about 30 or 40 years of Administrative Procedure Act case law, um, and that your approach, or the, the agency's uh, new approach of risk-based enforcement is actually a very sound, evidence-based, um, uh, triage-based approach mm -hmm to enforcing what has to be the right answer, which is all this stuff is completely, flagrantly in violation of the drug uh, portions of the FDNCA, but we can't get to it all, and it might not be worth agency and uh, resources given the vast universe of frauds and quackery being perpetrated on, on the American public. I couldn't agree with you more, and, and, and that is my argument, that this is a very sound middle ground approach. And if you, if you look at how the agency has regulated in other areas, it has adopted a risk-based approach in other areas as well, in terms of the new FISMA rules, the Food Safety Modernization Act, handling imports and exports and being able to balance the staggering number of imports into the country, and how do you inspect them for the most concerning, most dangerous products, most likely to cause public health concerns. So I do think that it is, it, I think it's the right approach, and, and, and time will tell. So, so given Professor Chen's provocation, I'll give it one person a chance to respond if anyone would like to, and then I'll give Carrie the last word. Sure. Okay. Hi, again. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to respond to that, actually. We've just, you've just have, uh, you have to do it in a minute. That's your challenge. Okay. And then you can, then, then <laughs> well, you I haven't the really, okay, I ha I, this will probably be all over the place because I, I haven't really organized my thoughts so much. But I do want to just point out that it, I think it's a little ridiculous to say that there's no scientific evidence that homeopathic products are safe and um, um, reliable because 
it, it, it's interesting to, I, I just don't see it as a divide. I don't think it's homeopathic versus medicine and that they should be against each other. I mean, I really do think that they go hand in hand because if you look back for medicinal, dr like most drug products originally came derived from something in nature. There is plenty of credible third party organizations and institutions that do incredible research over um, things you can find in nature and their healing properties. So for just one example, the chaga fungus has been proven to be extremely effective in fighting um, cancer cells. And it's, no, it's by no means, I would never say it's a treatment to cancer, but it's an excellent preventative measure and can really help in the chemotherapy process. Um, and you know, that is very well proven. And so, I, so I just, we're just out of time, and people okay, have to go I'm to sorry. class. So, and I want to give. Can I just say one more thing? Carrie, okay. uh, the final word. <laughs> Ten seconds. I think I think it's unfair to um, victimize the homeopathic market and not like big pharma because FDA, you know, there's a huge problem with the agency capture of big pharma, and and we have to look at how big pharma has also played a very dangerous public um, health cause with this opioid addiction, you know, it, they have pushed that on the American people. So, I, you know, I, there's, there's evils on both sides. Thank you. Exactly. I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. Um, I'll stick around afterwards if you want to chat afterwards. Final words? Okay, so final words. Thank you for that. Uh, final comments, uh, yes. Uh, again, though, my concern is that the way that these products are manufactured, composed, labeled, and diluted, there really haven't been any of those double-blind studies to support these formulations under these terms of use. Um, so for me, that is my concern. That is the issue. Um, definitely Big Pharma is responsible, but interestingly enough, homeopathics, people have this idea that these are small little companies. And yes, some of them are, uh, but these are actually, these have become nutraceutical giants manufacturing these products in mass in China in India um, so th they are almost the flip side now of big pharma and the industry is growing so I think there's a misconception that these are smaller safer uh, companies when th that's just not the case anymore today uh, across the board um, so you can see why this is a problem um, why it's complicated and challenging there are no easy fixes and I hope everyone sitting in these rooms, especially the students, are committed to tackling these problems um, over the next several decades. Thank you. Thank you.